Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Fourth Plain Church of the Nazarene. I am Pastor John. It is good to see all of you and a lot of new people today. Glad to see you for Memorial Day weekend. Uh, speaking of Memorial Day weekend, today is our memorial service for our Fourth Plain family. And uh, we are continuing our annual tradition of remembering those of our Fourth Plain Church family who have passed away last year. Um, this is not a, a replacement of those who have served. It is just an addition. If you have served, would you please stand? Thank you for your service. And we thank you that because of your contribution, well, and the sacrifice that you made, we are able to worship here today and honor the ones that we've lost as well. June 1st is a missionary night. We're going to welcome Colin and Shireen Elliott. They're Nazarene missionaries from Africa. And that's a whole service um, for, and what I mean by that is uh, everyone's invited. We're not gonna uh, separate kids and teens. We're all gonna come and hear, the, hear, hear, the, hear what they have to say. And every missionary night is always edifying. It's always good to hear and return to the gospel, see how it's planted. Uh, Country Gospel Sing will be June 3rd, that's this Friday at 6.30. And also, uh, the library is open. We still have that in our e-minders. We have a church library downstairs. If you ever want to deepen your knowledge a little bit, whether it's through classic devotional works, there's some really good holiness classics down there. There's also a lot of Bible dictionaries, a lot of stuff about prophecy, uh, and it's the whole spectrum. It's not just one particular subject. Uh, please check out our library down in Franklin Hall. That is Franklin Hall, yes. I always get Franklin Hall and the Ed Wing mixed up, and I feel like now I'm comfortable enough to be, like, be able to express that, and I always have to. <laughs> it's been a while, but I know where it is, so. Let's pray. Father God, our most loving Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and Father from whom the Holy Spirit proceeds. Lord, prove your love to us a day, today once again. We thank you for those who have given themselves for us today. And we thank you that they follow your, the example of your son, Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, be with us in the service. Be with Pastor Grady as he preaches. Pastor Paul as she teaches. And let us focus on you. In your name, amen. Don't 
don't deserve the kind of favor you have always shown. But you don't have to tell me it's true how much you love me. And I know I'll still know if you never speak another word of blessing. And the silence leaves me with a sense of loss. I'll remember if my heart begins to question any doubt that you loved me was settled at the cross. Every word was mercy. Every breath you gave. Every drop of blood testifies of grace. So if you never speak another word of blessing, and the silence leaves me with a sense of loss, should know what to expect by now. So what do I have up here? My trusty, technically rusty <laughs> toolbox. Found in my classroom because, you know, there are just times that you need a good tool, right? Are there no men in the audience? <laughs> Isn't it all about having the right tool when you need it? Yes. And when you need a tool, you need the right one? How many have had to stop in the middle of what you're doing and go get to, and get, thank you. Wherever Jerry is, I'm sure his hand is up somewhere. Okay, well, <clears throat> have you ever wondered what God's toolbox looks like? Have you ever wondered that? Look around, look around the room. Look at each other. Okay, I see three people looking at each other and now they're all freaked out because no one else is looking around. You guys, that's what God's toolbox looks like. We are his tools. And he has a different tool for every job that he has, yes? Would you like to see what my toolbox looks like? <laughs> Sandy's like, no, it's okay. Well, as any good children's pastor, you have to have caution tape for many different reasons. And others have even said, oh, I need this. I'm like, what are you looking for? I'm a children's pastor. I have everything. You're not going to have this. What do you need? I need caution tape. Here you go. <laughs> okay? Good children's pastor, always prepared. You need caution tape for many, many, a plethora of reasons. You always have to have good games on hand because you never know when your lesson is going to bomb or some people just don't stop talking long enough to get the point across. So you're just like, okay, just give up. Let's just play spot it. All right, right? Now, no children's pastor worth their weight would not have, well, I have one of them. I'll get to the other one. Bob and Larry, right? So here's Larry, made, to me, made for me by one of my kids. Bob's in there hiding. He'll come out when we find him. Now, also, a good children's pastor has to have good cheerleader skills, right? Because we've got to cheer the kids on, right? Okay. And... Of course, you, know, you need to teach the kids about, you know, you can't hide from God. You can't, 
you know, you can't play all incognito. God sees you through and through, right? And you just never know when you need some good um, eyeglass props, okay? Whoops, it's taking me all over the place here. Oh, now you know, some of you have met Charlie before, but you got to always have good props for sermon in a sack because you never know what the kids are going to pick. Now, do you, if, for those of you that worked at VBS last year, they stuck Charlie in there, and I didn't know it, and they picked this one, and I had to come up with a sermon in a sack. I was almost stumped. Haven't been stumped in 14 years. You know what it was? I'm sitting here going, okay, what can I do with this? What can I do with this? And then it hit me. We talked about let your yes be yes and your no be no. <laughs> now, that's a good children's pastor right there. All right. You never know when you're going to need to go incognito or play musical wigs or whatever. Now, oh, here's Bob. He was hiding. So we got Bob and Larry. Now, good children's pastor has this, the, the props that they need to teach the kids to examine their hearts. Are you walking with the Lord? Is the Holy Spirit living out through you, right? We need to examine God's word closely, okay? So you always have to have that. Now, you always have to be prepared with crafts, right? Now, if you're ever working in my department, do not buy glitter. <laughs> you will lose your volunteership. No, right? No glitter. Glitter is sin. And, of course, none of that is any good without the word of God. Right? So these are just some of the things that make me me. <laughs> Sorry, God made me and you hired me, so there you go. But these are just some of the things in my, my toolbox, the things that God gifted me with. Um, but think about what would be in your toolbox. He created all of us for a purpose, to bring glory to his kingdom and to be, bring people into the body of Christ. So just take a moment this week. What are the things that God has put in your toolbox that allows you to share the gospel and to be Jesus to people, to grow the kingdom. Thanks. Morning, everyone. From one tool to another. So uh, like Pastor John was saying, today's our uh, traditional fourth plane celebration of life, the passing uh, of our family members, uh, over the last year. Say, I'm blessed to participate by doing this, doing this reading that was uh, put together by family and friends information and organized by Pat Bowden. Uh, it amazes me as I was going through this how much I did not know about these people. I've seen them, I've been around them, maybe said hi, but I didn't know them. I mean, we all seem to come into the church, we all sit in the same pew start doing something where we sit by other people. That would be such a uh, I should have known more about them. I didn't, as I said. Um, I think there's a lesson. I think there's a lesson for all of us. So uh, as we go through this, uh, keep that in mind and listen about these people and see if you know them. First one is Mary Louise Ammon. She was born in 1927 in Etowah, North Carolina, in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Louise was the eldest of five children of uh, Reverend L.C. Stevens, a circuit-riding Methodist preacher, and Julia Nichols Stevens, a teacher and homemaker. Louise's growing up years during the Depression were reminiscent of the Waltons, for those of you that know what the Waltons were and spawned many heartwarming stories of the rambunctious family, which included brothers Richard, Francis, and Glenn, as well as Sister Vanjie. Louise was a brilliant student, was valedictorian of the old Vancouver High School in 1944. She was recruited to work at the FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. as part of the home front effort during World War II Later, she returned to Asheville and began a nursing school. She met a dashing young man, Edgar Ammons, whom she married. In 1963, Louise and Edgar moved to Orchards, Washington, where they raised three children, David, Marilyn, and Shirley Janney. 
She had four grandchildren and one great-grandchild. Edgar was the love of her life and she never remarried after he passed away in 1984. Louise loved travels to the Oregon coast, Christmases in Olympia, and car trips with her daughter Shirley around the Northwest and visiting family back East. They also traveled to Israel. Robert John Bob Chambers was born in Paulson, Montana, God's country, on March 13, 1935, on the family farm to John and Anna Finkminer Chambers. The weather uh, was so bad the day Bob was born, the doctor couldn't make it out to the farmhouse, so poor John had to get the doctor with his team of horses. Times were hard and life was simple in this in his early years. At about 11, the family moved to Spokane, Washington. He attended Central Valley High School where he played, in the, played the sousaphone in the band. He graduated from CVHS in 1952 and went straight to boot camp for the Air National Guard, graduating in 1953. He met Phyllis, his soon-to-be wife, while she was waiting tables. They married on December 6, 16, 1956, and built their life together for 54 years. He held various jobs in his adult life as a gas station attendant, a pin setter at the bowling alley, and finally a job at Union Pacific Railroad building bridges. He worked his way up from Rivets Holler to welder, to foreman, and finally to bridge inspector. After 36 years, he and Phyllis in 1991 returned to Lapine, retired to Lapine, Oregon. He continued inspecting bridges as an independent contractor, which allowed him to travel to Brazil and Hawaii. He loved playing Santa Claus in many different locations, including the care facility where Phyllis was in 2009 also the Orchards, Orchards Shopco, as well as the RAD Outreach Program in Washougal. During his marriage, he had four children, plus two from Phyllis's previous marriage. He loved his children, 14 grandchildren, 20 great-grandchildren, and even four great-great-grandchildren. He was known for his orneriness and teasing with all his kids. He would call them either George or Sam, no matter what their name was. When one granddaughter was named Samantha, Bob enjoyed the fact that he could call her Sam and be right. He never called her anything but Sam her entire life, and it was very special to them both. Bob first came to Fourth Plain Church through the country gospel ministry in 2016 and 17. He attended church whenever he could. He was a quiet presence but always friendly. He passed away January 18th, 2022, at the age of 86. He was a pleasure to have around and a joy to know. Barbara Jane Cheney was born November 4th, 1928 in Sacramento, California. She passed away from complications of COVID in September 25th, 2021. Barbara went to work for the state of California straight out of high school in 1946 and retired in 1979. She was married to Ray Irwin on November 13, 1949 and had three children, Randy, David, and Dee Kellogg. She came to know the Lord in 1970. She was always a hard worker who raised her three children on her own she then married John Cheney in 1979. After John passed away in 2000, Barbara moved to Vancouver in 2001 and began attending fourth play. Barbara was a quiet lady who loved basketball, softball, and dancing as a young person. Later, her interest travel turned to travel and cruising. One road trip to Nebraska with her whole family was the highlight of her life. She always felt she had a hard but happy life. Barbara attended Sunday school regularly and had a good knowledge of the word. She volunteered for most children's church activities, fall festival, VBS, and the extravaganza each year. 
She was always smiling and was a crucial part of our congregation. We will miss her smiling face. Marilyn Louise Hemingway was born August 13, 1940 and passed away at the age of 80 on February 19, 2021. Marilyn was a member of the church for 44 years and was instrumental in bringing her granddaughter, Corey Tomasini, to the church. Pastor Lyle and Anna Koblenz remember that Marilyn was a wonderful lady. She was always helping around the church, was always supporting the church, and although very quiet and subdued, was an encourager. You had to pay attention or you wouldn't know she was there. Several of her children passed away prior to her own death. She was a faithful mother and grandmother, as well as a faithful Christian. Marvin Hopwood was born November 12, 1939, and passed away August 27, 2021, from kidney failure and bone cancer. Marvin was 62 years old. He met Maggie through the passing away of a mutual friend. Marvin was such a nice man and so calm and pleasant that Maggie Murphy fell in love and they were married on March 8, 1987 and were married for 34 years. Marvin was one of nine children. His parents moved uh, them from Colorado to Idaho. All of the other children remained in Idaho except Marvin who headed west. Marvin and Maggie have five grown children, Kathy, John, Daryl, Sharon, and Mike. He loved to play with these kids and they loved him. By trade, Marvin was a mill worker at the paper mill in West Lynn until his retirement. M Marvin became a computer geek after retiring and spent many hours learning about it. Marvin and Maggie bought a travel trailer after they had retired and spent many years fishing and hunting together throughout the Northwest. Salmon was the fish of choice in the Hopwood family and Marvin loved catching them. He bought Maggie a rifle so she could hunt with him, but she never shot a deer. Maggie began bringing her children to Fort Plain Church early in their marriage. Marvin chose not to attend, but she didn't mention it to him. One day out of the blue, he announced that he would be attending church. Maggie's not sure when he got saved, but knew he never failed to attend church after that. Marvin and Maggie attended Fourth Plain Church of the Nazarene together since 1997 and were involved in the adult ministries, especially Prime Timer's Breakfast on Saturday. He was a big, soft-hearted, kind man. He will be missed. Donna Faye Manor went home to be with Jesus during uh, December 19th, 2019. She was born Donna Brown, on January 25, 1938 in Camas, Washington. Donna was, Donna was married on February 12, 1960 to George Manor. After 51 years of marriage in 2021, Jesus called George home. Donna and George made their home first in Fern Prairie, Camas, and then in Vancouver Heights. In 1967, they purchased the Minute Mart store at Park Hill Shopping Center and enjoyed the entire community there. After selling the store, Donna worked at several retail positions, including the 88 cent store, if you can remember those, Clark College, and Kmart, where she later retired. Donna also worked as a cytologist at Emanuel Hospital. Donna loved God and being at church. She grew up in the First Church of God. She and George later attended Fourth Plain Church in the Nazarene where she played the piano. Donna always loved music and lived out her faith daily. God's light was shown to the people around her as she lovingly shared Christ with them. Donna loved her children, son Dale and Micheline Manor, daughter Brenda and Jerry Hoffman, and daughter Bobby who sadly passed away last April. Donna had six grandchildren and six great-grandchildren whom she adored. Donna also, uh, Donna also had a contagious sense of humor and will be missed by all. Susan Mason was born May 20th, 1943. She passed away in December of 2021. 
from complications of COVID-19. Her soon-to-be husband, Harvey, was attending school at Portland State University and was set to return to his home in Hermiston and had a date with Susan. On June 1st, 1966, he proposed to her. While she told, when she told her mom, she asked, why would you want to marry your friend? After they told both parents, they were married June 18, 1966, and returned to live in Portland for several years. They bought a house in Vancouver, but had built a house in Brush Prairie by 1978. They lived in Brush Prairie until her death. Harvey still lives there. Before she was married, Susan was a model for the high-end fashion store Berg's in Portland. She injured her back in an accident and was never able to return to her job after the marriage, after marriage. Susan suffered from fibromyalgia, a, long, a lifelong illness. Harvey and Susan had two children, a boy who currently lives in Houston and a girl who lives here in Hawkinson. Susan stayed home and stayed and started a daycare which she ran for years. Eventually her daughter joined her and they successfully continued the business for 15 or 20 years. The principals of the local school recommended Susan's daycare to all their teachers and staff so they were never at a loss for children. Jim Miller married Francis September 27, 2009. Born June 9, 1933 in Coffeyville, Kansas, joined, uh, Jim joined Fourth Plain Church on August 25, 2013. His father was a Nazarene minister and preached all over the South. Jim went to Trebekah Nazarene College. Jim was very devoted to the church and served in various positions in ministry. He loved God first and foremost. He prayed for perseverance of the church and togetherness for all members. He was a godly father, grandfather, and husband, and loved his church friends. Jim and Francis especially enjoyed going to the beach. His cat loved him and spent all his time being around Jim. When Jim passed, the cat was confused and lonely. Finally, Francis was able to befriend the cat, and twice a day she goes and lays down on the bed so the cat can climb up and lay beside her to take a nap. It's something she does for Jim. Jim passed away September 10th, 2021. Marilyn Marty Thiessen was born April 16th, 1940 and passed away May 3rd, 2021. Although she was a faithful attender of Fourth Plain Church of the Nazarene since joining November 29th of 2015, we were unable to lo locate friends or family members to get more information for our memorial service. She attended church with Patty Burrell, who passed away in 2017. She was also fond of Harlan and Barbara Cannon. All of the contacts we made attempts to find out more. The most common observation about Marty was that she had a wonderful smile and was enjoyed by all. Mabel Allen passed away at the age of 93 on May 20th, 2022, due to complications of lung cancer. She was born in Los Angeles in 1929 and lived a very adventurous life. She was a wonderful cook and cooked most of her life in line camps. The rest of her life was spent taking care of people. When she retired at age 85, she was still taking care of old people many younger than herself. Mabel had four children. Her oldest son passed away in 1976. Another younger son died in 2005. George Roof, the middle son, and her daughter Susan Guerrero are her surviving children. Mabel had 17 great-grandchildren and, and six great-great-grandchildren. Mabel joined Fourth Plain Church in 2010. She was a big Minnie Mouse fan and visited Disneyland many times with her kids. When she was cremated, the smallest Minnie Mouse was with her. Mabel was one of the sweetest ladies you would ever want to know. She cared a great deal for people who spent her life caring for them. The family has great memories of their mom and will be missed.
Gary Earl was born July 21st, 1944 and passed away May 25th, 2022 from dementia. He also suffered from cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and Parkinson's disease. He and Jean were married on February 14, 1964. They had two children, Gordon, deceased uh, December 31, 2018, and Sherry McGill. He had two granddaughters and three great-grandsons. Great Gary worked in sawmills in the beginning of his working career then retained, retrained as a medical assistant in 1990. He worked mainly in a career in the cancer center with the doctor who later became his oncologist. In 2010, he retired due to health issues. He was a Sunday school teacher at Fort Plain Church for many years. He also compiled a large book collection as he was an avid reader. Gary was missing uh, the index finger on his left hand due to a sawmill accident. He had fun with children, learning to count on their own hands, then counting Gary's hands. They had 10 fingers, but he only had nine. They would count theirs, then his, then back and forth many times. After a while, the kids usually figured out something was wrong. Gary had a book filled with scriptures, articles, and thoughts about revival. He also included several personal prayers and we found one that we would like to share today. Oh Lord, send revival to me, my home, my church, my city, my county, my state, my country, and my world. Oh Lord, I pray for your revival to begin with me. Gary was a godly man above all, and we are glad he is at rest with his Savior. If you're a relative of any of these individuals, uh, will you please either stand or raise your hand so everyone can see who you are? Thank you very much for your sacrifice. Well, I want to thank uh, Bill and uh, and Pat for uh, putting that together. Isn't that something, how many uh, passed away during that time? It's good to see each and every one of you. Um, I got a call yesterday afternoon that uh, Darlene Skagg passed away. And uh, she is a good friend of, of Lois and she was broken hearted um, to hear. Today we uh, take time to reflect on those who have passed away from our church uh, family and it's amazing to see the pictures and all the names um, through, through the year that have, have passed away. Uh, we are a church family and so we have lost a brother or, or a sister Jesus blessed those who mourn. And Solomon said, it is better to go to a funeral than to a party. It kind of clears your head. Kind of reminds you that uh, one day our picture will be up there. And we need to realize that. And so we remember. We, we mourn. But we do not mourn as those with no hope but we still mourn. I have a passage of scripture I want to talk to you about, and it's in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 9. I've titled this, Living in a Tent. Have you seen a lot of those around? Go back. Have you seen a lot of those around? That's us. We're living in a tent. For we know that if our earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. But right now, um, all around us are, are tents 
and people living in, in tents all around, it is a, a visual reminder. I don't know if you saw at uh, Safeway, they tore down a bunch of trees. Have you seen them? And all kinds of rocks were there. Well, also tents were hidden within those trees. So we didn't even know that they were there, but once the trees were cut down, they were revealed. People were living in tents, real people trying to etch out an existence. Did you realize God lived in a tent? He had a tabernacle, and, and it was David who said, I want to build you a house because I live in a better house than you live in, and I, I don't want you to live in a tent anymore. And God said, I like my tent. And David finally convinced him, and God said, you're not going to build it, Solomon, or your, your son will, will build it. And so Solomon built him a permanent uh, house that wasn't so permanent because it was torn down also. But when Jesus came, John said that he came in a tent. He tabernacled among us. It was a tent. He liked living in a tent. He could move around with his people. And the tent of living uh, ended when David uh, built that house. But Jesus lived in a tent. Just seeing those tents make uh, some people angry. They, they don't like all the mess around. They, they don't like those tents. But Paul says... The tents are what we live in, just as the tabernacle was what God lived in in the wilderness. Now Paul says, we, our bodies, are tents. We go camping, and those who can afford an RV don't live in a tent, but those who have a tent they put it out, and they have an enjoyable time. We heard who that uh, George liked to, or Bob liked to go out and, and fish. People like living in tents for a little while, and then they stop living in tents. They fold up the tent, they put it in their car, then they put it in a garage or the shed, and they're done with it for the year. But... Our tent is not our permanent home. With great relief, we take that hot shower when we get home, and, and we have a, a, a meal that we can put in the microwave, and, and, and we have a soft bed to get into. We like our permanent, our stick-built home better than that tent. With great relief. It has served its purpose. The tent has served its purpose and is put away. It's your turn. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 2. For indeed this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Canvas tents are the worst. I don't know if you've stayed in a can. Uh, a, tent that is canvas, but if you touch the top of it when it's raining, what happens? It leaks. You know, they, those that are homeless and they have their tents, they figured that out a long time ago. They put plastic over that canvas if they have a canvas tent. They, they realize that, that uh, the tents are no good if you touch them. Uh, there's a lot of groaning that goes on. Why did you touch the top of the tent? Now we have leaks all over. And many have, our homeless are, are tired of tents. They want to live in a better place. And... They want to find, uh, they, they get a location that, that they have, and, and then someone complains, and they have to pack everything up and start all over again and make their tent somewhere else. They do a lot of groaning. 
we do a lot of groaning. My feet hurt and my ribs hurt. And there are times that I, I have asked Hannah, can you cut it? She's, in, she's been a, a, in nursing school for a year. Hannah, can you cut my feet off and I'll get some artificial feet and, and so it won't bother me. I'll take my, my ribs out and get some artificial ribs and then I won't, I won't hurt anymore. We do a lot of, gro I do, okay, I do a lot of groaning at home, all right? Chronic pain is, is, a, is harsh. Can I get an amen? amen? Chronic pain is terrible. Carolee suffers with it all the time. In this house, we groan. You know what is beautiful about Christianity is Jesus understands because he lived in a tent. And in, a, in the tent, he experienced hunger. He experienced uh, what it was like to be sleepy, and he slept through a storm. He was so tired. He was hungry. He was thirsty. And for the first time, God experienced pain. And he hated it. In the garden, he groaned so much that blood came from his pores. Jesus understands our tent. He understands our longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. It's interesting to me that after Jesus died, he still had his scars. Have you ever thought of that? Because he said to Thomas, stick your finger in my side. Stick it in my hand. He still had his scars, but it didn't hurt. They didn't hurt anymore. They were kind of a badge of honor. Longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. We groan these days. Let's read more of our text. Inasmuch as we have put it on, we will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a down payment. So, Paul says that we have the Holy Spirit as a down payment. Now that is one of the reasons why people rent today, is because they don't have a large down payment to put down. Isn't that right, Gene? And so the down payment of our heavenly dwelling is the Holy Spirit within us. That's our down payment. We've got it, folks. We don't have to earn it. We've got the down payment that will get us into heaven. Aren't you glad of that? Three of you are. That is wonderful. You three are enjoying this sermon. Right now, our tents are, that we live in are not permanent structures. But because we have the Holy Spirit living within us, that transition will come at our death. According to John 14... Verse 2, he goes to prepare a place for us. Now, in the Greek, it has either the abode or mansion. I like mansion. What's that, what, what's that, what's that song? I've got a, 
an abode. No, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright city. Never grow old. Boy, isn't that great? We'll never grow old. Some of us are older, aren't we, Trudy? Didn't you hit 90? Did you? Trudy can't hear me? Trudy, did you hit 90? Are you 90 years old? All right, sorry. <laughs> Should have kept my voice down. Next month, don't push it. Don't push it. You know, we, we, um, we like the thought of heaven. It's that dying part we don't like. That's the one that gets us. We'll talk about heaven all day long, but it's that dying part. And so Paul gives us a pep talk. He lets us know that we have this Holy Spirit that comforts us and, and will lead us on. It's a down payment. It's just a taste of what heaven is like. John Wesley talked about a holy dying, holy dying. A doctor during the time of Charles Wesley noted, most people die from fear of dying. But I never met with such people as yours. There are none of them who are afraid of death, but they are calm and patient and resign to the last. John Wesley's dying words were, the best of all is God is with us. He lifted up his arms and raised his feeble voice again, repeating the words, The best of all is God is with us. I've watched people die. I've worked in hospice. I've worked in a, in a uh, medical center with the inmates, and 140 died in a year. I've watched people die, and I've seen them struggle. I watched uh, one, one woman from our church who had a mother who just wouldn't die. She got to the point of saying, I wish she would die. How many of you want your mother to die? You know, not, not many of us. She got to that point. Her mother wasn't eating. Her mother was struggling every breath. Her mother was just deteriorating in front of her. And she was there week after week after week. And she kept struggling to live on and on and on. And her daughter finally said, I wish she would just die. There are people who struggle I would agree with John Wesley, we need to die holy. We need to die with a calmness. We need to die knowing that God is with us. That is how we ought to live, and that is how we ought to die. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6, your turn. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are, we are there, either here or there. We are absent from the Lord if we're here. We walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also 
have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. That is our goal. Whether we're here or there, we want to be pleasing to him. If we remain in our earthly bodies, we will not be able to see Jesus' face to face. And so, Paul says, right now, we walk by faith, not by sight. Absent from the body, physical death, though scary, is nothing compared to being home with the Lord. Paul is not wishing death on anyone. To complete his pep talk, he says, whether at home or absent, we want to be, our main goal is to be pleasing to the Lord. You see, death entered the world and we lost paradise. Click. That's not the right one. In our day, discontentment has grown. And we hear it echoed all around us. It is not enough. Our tents are not enough. We live in a land of not enough. Not enough money to cover our inflation. Have you seen the gas prices lately? We live in a land of not enough, not enough money to cover inflation, not enough vacation time, not enough Yankee championships, not enough hair, not enough dessert. Not enough affordable housing. Not enough time. We live in a land among people who carry the same disease. A land of not enough. This land is too short. It's not enough. Life is too short. It's not enough. From the garden to 2022, we still live in a land of not enough. Paul says in his text, we live in a tent. It won't even last. It's not enough. Our bodies are not enough to make it uh, to a, a thousand years. It's not enough. We're just hoping on a hundred. Right, Trudy? We want to make it to a hundred, right? <laughs> She's my comic relief. I, I don't know if you knew that. I don't think so. I'm just glad to be almost 90, but not yet. Not enough. Our bodies are not enough, and so we suffer living in the tent in the land of not enough, and we groan. It all began in the garden. There was a whisper from the serpent that said, God is keeping something from you. That tree over there, God said you can't eat anything any of the trees. God didn't give you enough. But that tree over there, that, that has something that God doesn't even want you to have. It started in the garden with that whisper that God was holding something back and they didn't have enough. When the serpent met Eve, he made it sound like God was holding the best for himself. 
Doubt entered her mind about God's provisions. The Bible says she looked on the tree. The one forbidden tree became her single focus. If you've ever dealt with addicts or been one yourself, they will only have one thing on their mind. And how to get that one thing. And so her focus became that one tree. And she wouldn't stop until she had her her husband that was right with her. And she grabbed the fruit, ate it, and gave it to him. Okay, I'll eat some. You see, God didn't give enough giving him all those other trees. It felt like it wasn't enough. And so, the serpent said, you'll never die. Even though God said, if you eat of that tree, you'll die. You'll never die by eating that. And she found after she ate it, she didn't die. But her son would not long after. And from this single act of disobedience to God's clear command, we now live in a land of not enough. What this world stirs up in us it cannot satisfy. If I only had this much money and you get this much money and what happens? It's not enough. We want more of it. Because someone else has more, now we want more than they have. They got a new car, so we're going to get a newer car. And then we find it's not enough, especially if a scratch gets on it. It's not enough. To understand Ecclesiastes, he calls himself a preacher. And he says we live in a land under the sun. And when he talks about that land under the sun, he says it's all vanity. Vanity of vanities. And he goes through this long list of everything he has tried in Ecclesiastes 2, that he let himself have all this, and he came to the end and he said, what the world stirs up, it doesn't satisfy. Vanity. That's all I found. But he's talking about under the sun. You see, we believe in a land that is above the sun. And that land is enough. But as long as we live under the sun, we live in a land of not enough. He comes to the very end of this very dreary. I, I, I had a men's Bible study and I, I took them through Ecclesiastes and, and had them read several passages in there. And they said, is that in the Bible? Is that really in the Bible? They had somehow just skipped over that. But at the very end, the preacher says, you know, I've come to this conclusion. That you must love God and follow his commands. And that is enough under the sun. Jesus met a man who... His question was, how can I have eternity? What 
must I do to be saved? How do I get there? And so Jesus gives, click, Jesus gives everything that he asked for by saying, give it all away, give it to the poor. He didn't say, give it to me, give it to my treasure. He said, give it to the poor and come follow me. Be my 13th disciple. And the man walked away from eternity. Because the Bible says he had what he thought was too much to give in the land of not enough. And so he walked away from salvation. And he went on his way. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Paul has an answer to living in a tent. It starts in Philippians 4, verse 11. Your turn. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Have you ever heard that verse? It is connected to how Paul has found contentment. And did you know it says, I learned contentment. We might pray, Lord, give me a contentment. And he will have you go through a series of trials. Because that is the only way he can get you to the place of being content. I find it interesting that Paul says, I have learned to be content when I have a lot. Now, now we would say, I would be content if I had a lot. You know, if I had no needs, I would be content. But he says, I've learned to be content with a lot. For richer or poor, for sickness and health, in poverty and in riches, I will love you. That's what we say in our marriage vows. We can understand that I, I need some help if I'm going to stay with you if we're poor. But it's also when we're rich, I will stay with you. I've learned contentment in all things. That is the secret of living in the land of not enough. So we come to the good news now. In a land of not enough, there's a Savior who is enough. The Bible says that Jesus came to his own and they rejected him. Their focus was on a land of not enough. They thought that they needed a King David that would give them the land and then they would be, it would be enough. But they had that in the past and they sinned. And that is why they lost their city and the temple. In John 14, Jesus informs his disciples 
what he is doing once he leaves them. He says, when I leave you, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you can be also. I'm going to prepare you not a tent. (laughs) I'm going to prepare you an adobe, right? No, a mansion. We want a mansion. But Jesus also says, in the land of not enough, I will not leave you as orphans. In the land of not enough, we will not be homeless in the land of enough we will not be homeless no more living in a tent a mansion awaits us in the land of enough there is nothing cheap allowed there's nothing from Lowe's or Home Depot I mean it's the good stuff It's a pearly gate that is made by one pearl. It's precious stones that are put in the wall. There's no wood, no cement. It's the good stuff because it's the land of enough. In the land of enough, a bride adorned for her husband, streets of gold, a wall of every kind of precious stone, nothing that the land of not enough, there's no lows that will be allowed inside. And it is a city of enough. And our heart longs for it. But we have to wait. It's a not yet. Our present land of not enough will fade away. Our hope is found in a prepared place, a land of enough. The writer of the book of Hebrews agrees as this life is not enough. And he talks about the heroes of faith and says that they all die in faith. Then he makes this observation. They desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Our present world is not enough, and God knows it. And so he not only placed eternity in our hearts, as Solomon says, but he made it possible to fulfill our dreams and live in a better country. So for now, we live in the land of not enough where death comes as a shock. But just as Jesus' death was not the end of the story, neither is our death. We have a choice to make in the land of not enough. Will we live like there's no tomorrow, or will we accept Jesus' invitation? Come unto me, believe in me. And we will find the ultimate cure for the land of not enough. The writer of the Hebrews was concerned with his Jewish brothers. He thought that the his brothers were not accepting Christ as their Savior, that they were settling for something less. They were saying that this land is enough. And so he says in Hebrews 4.1, 
your turn. Oh, it's Lord, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. See, now that confuses you when red comes up and you're not uh, reading along with it. So I'll give you a pass on that one. Therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you seem to come short of it. His concern is my concern. I don't want anyone here not to be in heaven with us. I don't want you to come short. We were not made to live in tents permanently. Sin made us temporary. It was not God's choice to have death. That's not his choice. This world is not enough, and we should never be settlers like the rich young ruler who said, I have enough. You know, it's interesting. Not, not that anything else I've said hasn't been interesting, but it is interesting that the 24 elders in heaven that John saw when the Lamb and God came in, they took their crowns that they had earned all the good things that they ever did on earth. And they took those crowns <laughs> and they threw them down at the feet of Jesus. And they said, it's enough just being here, just having you. You are the worthy one. Nothing that I did is worthy as you stand with me. Praise God whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We're going on the road. That was beautiful. Shake hands and be friendly, even if you're not. <laughs>